Here we are, episode 9, and this is going to be a big one. Last year at this exact time, I did a video on Imogene Pass from Telluride to Ure, and it was a video like no one has ever done before. And I say that because while I was here this time in Ure, I ran into three dozen people that had been here because they had seen the video that I put up last year. Well, this year we're going to do your aid to tell you ride, and I'm going to show you things that you have never seen on this trail, and I'm going to show you how to make it down this trail without killing yourself. How is that for visibility? 13,000 feet. There's the trail. The weather in the mountains can change in a heartbeat. That's no joke at all. I went up to the top of Imogene Pass three times in the last four days and once during a storm and it was off the hook. And it's snowing at a good clip right now. And the worse the weather got, the worse the drivers on the trail got. And I'm going to show you how to make it through this trail without flipping your vehicle or without flipping your lid. So you're going to want to sit back, you're going to want to relax, and you're going to want to check this out. Ure, Colorado is widely regarded as one of America's most beautiful towns. Although the town was built by mining, it was the spectacular beauty of the area that gave Ure long life as a tourist destination. Now I've been out here a dozen times and every single time I come out here I see something that I didn't see the time before. After the silver crash of 1893 when many mining com communities were destined to become ghost towns, C.L. Hall remarked, Ure is peerless. She will be famous as a mountain resort when many of the now famous watering places are abandoned and forgotten. Now I've been in many, many small towns, many, many remote towns, many towns nestled in the mountains and none of them compare to Ure. The entire town caters to people that are coming to explore the San Juan Mountains. The town of Ure was named after Ute Chief Ure, who worked for years to find peaceful resolution to the escalating conflicts that were occurring as more and more white people poured into the region in the 1860s and 1870s. Prospectors first arrived in the Ure area in 1861. After discovering placer gold, some stayed the winter of 1861 to 62 in the canyon that would later be the site of the town of Ure. It would be well over a decade, however, before the district would develop and the town established. Now, without gold and silver mines, Imogene Pass probably wouldn't be a thing, but fortunately it is. So we get to use this 16 mile long trail that goes up to 13,200 feet because of the mines. And we still share that because the mines are still up there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you down this trail. I'm going to show you things on here that you would probably miss otherwise. And I'm going to show you how to get around other people and navigate this trail safely. Every single solitary time I'm out here, somebody goes off the trail 
and this time was no different. While I was on Imogene, somebody was going off of Black Bear Pass. It happens. This is not an amusement park. There are no do-overs. Way too many people come on this trail and think that nothing can go wrong, and sadly, it does. So you're going to want to follow along with me, and I'm going to walk you through it. So let's check this out. So I'm in Ure, Colorado. It's 7.35. Sun goes down in 25 minutes. And we're at that awkward time where I need to find a place to park the truck and pop the top for the night. I don't want to head up the mountain yet. I'd rather start in the morning, I guess. And it's supposed to rain all day, so that's gonna make for a better video. I parked the truck at the base of a mountain as storm clouds kept coming in and I hit the sack, dreaming of Imogene Pass in the morning, much like a child waiting for Santa. Okay, it's 9.25 in the a.m. Thursday morning, and it is raining out here in Ure, Colorado, but I'm heading up the mountain right now. It's time to do part two a year later. I did tell your ride to Ure last year. This year, we're gonna do Ure to tell your ride and back in a rainstorm. Beautiful. So here we are. We're at the entrance of Imogene Pass. Now you can keep going straight and go down to Yankee Boy, which is an easy, easy, good trail. <clears throat> or you can go down to Imogene. Now it's raining up here, but. It just looks spectacular. Are you kidding me? Clouds all lit up with a little ray of sunshine. You gotta love it. Even though I knew the weather was going to be bad, it didn't worry me at all. My truck's equipped and I'm equipped. Don't be afraid to head up there in bad weather. Just make sure you have food, water, communications, and the proper attire because the temperature can swing drastically from 50 degrees to 90 degrees or all the way back down again. I was prepared for this and I was actually stoked that the weather was going to be bad because it made for more water crossings and more difficult trails. I've done Imogene Pass a dozen times and every single time it does not disappoint. I always see something new that I didn't notice the time before and this time around I got it on film. So let's head in. Now if you're new to off-roading or you're using a rental Jeep, keep the vehicle in four-wheel drive low. I see so many people that are driving through here and they're not even in low range. Low range keeps you from destroying your brakes. You need your brakes on Imogene Pass, trust me. So now you're officially on the trail, and as soon as you enter Imogene Pass from Ure, you'll probably see other vehicles camped out for the night. Technically, you're not supposed to camp up there, but I've done it, everyone does it. If you do camp up there, understand that setting a fire at 10 to 13,000 feet is difficult due to the lack of air. So be ready for that. This is the first major obstacle you're going to encounter, and it's easy to do, four wheel low, don't worry about your brakes. I'm taking it easy because I have a mountain bike on the back and I'm not sure how much clearance I have as of yet, but that will be tested. Now the first mile or so on Imogene is a lot of water and a lot of rocky shelves. Just take it easy, pick your best lane, and hope for the best. I've seen people in Subarus do this. I've seen people in minivans do this. They do damage, but they still do it. It's all good. Don't worry and stay away from the edges and you'll be good.
If you find yourself on a rock formation or a decline that worries you, go super slow, four wheel low at all times. Try to avoid using your brakes if you can. Once you get past all the really difficult rocky shelves, you'll notice that there's pullover spots where you can do overlooks of the mining camp below. Just bear in mind, there's no railing and it's straight down. That is straight down, but it's an epic lookout point, in my opinion. Now, without this mine and the mines that came before this, chances are Imogene Pass wouldn't exist. It could be a hiking trail, but chances are it wouldn't be an off-roading tra trail. So for all those people that frown upon the mining community, without them, you wouldn't be watching this video. Chances are. Now, after you reach this point, you're going to come to a small building that I like to call the birthplace of Donald J. Trump. Now, don't shelter in place. That was simply a joke. If you look around while you're walking down the trail towards this small building, you'll see the wood that they put in the ground to reinforce it for the wagons and the mules and donkeys and whatever else. It's pretty crazy. Now, I couldn't find any history on this building, but I'll tell you, it was probably just a residence or where the foreman shacked up because there's a mine shaft right over to the left behind here that you're not supposed to go into and I didn't it was flooded anyway but just looking at this building is very very cool the fact that the bed frame still stands and it does act as a emergency spot for hikers or the like because it will offer you shelter this building's been standing here for probably well over a hundred years if I had to guess based on the construction of it I love this stuff As badly as I wanted to go in this cave right here, I didn't because it was flooded and it did say no trespassing. I try to respect all private property and no trespassing because I don't want to be the guy that gets the trail shut down because I was that dude. You know what I'm saying? But it's very interesting. So once you make it past that small shack and cave, you're going to start going down on a really rocky road that's going to come out to an enormous valley. Now the valley is where you start going up. And you'll continue to go up till you eventually re reach Imogene Pass. But I'm going to show you this area right here and some waterfalls and some wildlife that you probably wouldn't notice otherwise. And it's truly epic. Depending on the weather, you can see forever. And even when it's stormy out, it's still amazingly beautiful. This is the valley, and from the parking spot, I have the waterfall to my left. If you look down, you'll see it. So when you're in the valley, this is what you're looking at. A large mountain face with some alpine trees on it. And if you're parked here and out of your vehicle, you'll hear small mountain mammals making squeaking noises like a stuffed animal. They don't even sound real and yet they are. And this is what they are. These are pikas. They're a small mountain dwelling mammal found in Asia and North America. And they make a hilarious noise just like a stuffed animal. Once you pull over and park, you'll hear them calling back and forth, and it's really rather comical. But, onto the waterfalls. Now this is the valley that you're in. You just came out of the entrance, or the wooded section of Imogene. You've got this large valley to go through, and then you start going up. Most people overlook this waterfall right here, which is really rather beautiful. Now this often overlooked waterfall 
Its origins are someplace near the peak. I've never actually seen the source. But when the weather is frightful, as it was on this day, this was just a slight clearing in the clouds. This waterfall runs really rapidly, and it's huge. It's absolutely massive. It goes a good couple of thousand feet from up to the bottom that I could see. And I risked losing the drone filming as close as I did to the treetops, but it is what it is. I thought it was well worth it. And the very end of this waterfall is truly epic, like so many up here on Imogene. It's amazing how many waterfalls are hidden here, there, and everywhere all over this mountain. But usually people passing through are so focused on the trail or recovering from the trauma the trail just caused, they don't actually notice this. I've been up here a lot of times. I spent a lot of time in this particular valley. And this waterfall never fails to amaze me. That's amazing. We do not have these in Boston at all. So there, as they say, is that. Okay, this is the shelf road in the valley with all the broken stones, and we're going to be heading up. There's a dirt path to the left, and then there's a stone crawl to the right. The crawl is actually safer than the path. We're heading towards the large stream crossing that everyone knows about that has a waterfall to the right and left hand side. Going to the right and going up onto the stone and staying close to the bushes is far more stable than the dirt path down the bottom because you're riding right on the edge and there's several rocks in the dirt path on the left that will lean you towards the fall, which you don't want. Plus, it makes for much better Instagram pictures and isn't that what it's all about at the end of the day? Now once you cross through the stream, there's a fork directly in front of you. To the left, that continues to crawl upwards towards Imogene Pass, or the peak itself. But if you take a right, over here you'll find some mining ruins as well as an amazing waterfall. Just be respectful of the fact that to the left of the waterfall there is a grave, or what appears to be one. But the waterfall is amazing. To the left of the waterfall, there's a spot where you can park, and I've actually camped here numerous times. There's remnants of a mining shack with railroad tracks that they brought the gold or silver down in small carts. You can still see it everywhere, and it's amazing because this has been here for a hundred plus years easily, and it still remains. It's pretty amazing. I just love this stuff, and hopefully you do too, because it's our history.
and right over your shoulder when you're looking at the waterfall is the shelf road that you're going to need to take. Now this road is a touch sketchy if you've never done it before, but it's totally passable. I've watched station wagons, Dodge Durangos, all sorts of wacky vehicles do this trail. My truck with a 7 inch lift total and the weight that I'm carrying, I'm basically living out of the truck. It makes it a little more interesting because this particular shelf road tends to lean you towards the drop off. But I've never even heard of anybody going over this one. It's just a little sketchy. So four wheel low, take it slow. Whoever's going up has the right of way. Just remember those things and you will be five by five or good to go. So after you clear this part, you're going to come to another stream crossing and another area where lots of people camp. Now you're really starting to head up. Now all along the trail, there's bypasses. You don't have to take the rocky stuff, but sometimes the rocky stuff is your best bet. After this point on the trail, there's a lot of switchbacks because you're starting to go straight up in elevation and the road can get very tricky, big time. There you go. No matter how well built the vehicle is, operator error can cause you to spin your tires. When you continue up the road towards Imogene Pass, you're going to come to another stream crossing on the left, but to the right there's a large open quarry with an old mining building in there. And I never actually went up there, so I went up there and got a little bit of footage for you. Now I took footage on three separate occasions in three consecutive days. This was the day that the sky was actually clear. But that changed very quickly. The weather changes in 10 to 20 minutes from beautiful skies to hail in a heartbeat. It's amazing. Now bear in mind, while all the other tourists are using oxygen tanks, I'm vaping. And the vaping will show up right here. Eleven thousand five hundred climbing kicks your ass. Okay, this is original. I'm pretty certain particle board is not original. That's sarcasm, folks. Okay, we're back on the trail. This is the last stream you're gonna cross as you start making your ascent to Imogene Pass, 13,200 feet. So if you've made it this far, it's official. You are heading up to Imogene Pass, to the peak. Now the entire way, you can see for miles. Always pay attention to the trail way ahead of you 
and make sure there's no oncoming traffic because there's places you can pull over here and there, but they're sparse. The last thing in the world you want to do is to be backing down a pass. My truck weighs almost 7,000 pounds. Backing down a pass that's a, a 6% grade, my brakes don't work. Most people's brakes don't work. So pay attention to that. This is not an amusement park. It's easy to do if you use a little common sense. Now this is a video for another day, but take note of the vehicles right now. None of them are letting me go, even though I'm going up and I have the right of way. But that's a video for another day. But I'll tell you what, there'd be a hell of a lot less accidents if people actually knew what the tiny handful of rules were. Side-by-sides, razors, they don't even consider the rules. They just do whatever they want. I'm coming up an incredibly steep grade and I'm going over some really rough terrain. It's hard to tell from the video, but I am. They don't even care. They just roll right by. No big deal. And that's the problem on the trails. And apparently that problem's made it to the Chamber of Commerce, the rental agencies. It's a thing. Just like Moab had to consider banning side-by-sides. There's only a few rules on the road when you're on the trail and people can't even learn those. So they'll probably take them away because that's how they roll. Try to bear in mind that when you're out here, there's many places where you don't see anybody else for quite a while. And as you've already seen, most people that you do see, they're doing their own thing. They don't care about you. I travel solo and I am prepared in case of pretty much any contingency. Getting, getting bodily harm, damage to the vehicle, something snapping. I have most of those bases covered because you're in a very remote area Rescue is a long ways away, and I've seen it happen on the mountain, and it's ugly. So just bear that in mind. The trail is without a doubt totally doable. Just a little bit of common sense and know the four or five rules or trail etiquette that help everybody get back down the mountain safely. And this is 12,000 feet. 1,300 more feet to go. So we reach the summit, and then to the other side. So for all the climbing, all the obstacles, all the different things you saw on both sides of the trail, you finally come to a fork and you take a right and you are now ascending to the very summit, 13,200 feet, straight up. And the first day that I did this, this is what it looked like when I got to the top of the trail. A storm had moved in and visibility was zero. So. I got to the top, I spun the truck around, and I parked. You can't see anything. Everything is absolutely white. But then, it started snowing. But if that wasn't enough, it started hailing. So while I'm sitting there doing the smart thing, I watch at least a dozen vehicles do things that I can't believe nobody got killed. And fortunately, I got most of it on video. 
Now, a lot of people aren't going to like me after I show this, but I'll tell you what. These guys had no business doing what they were doing on this trail whatsoever at all. You see that sky? You can't see anything. And again, it has yet to start snowing. That's coming. So I'm sitting up there. Nobody else is up there. So I decide to pull over because the storm is getting worse and visibility is getting much worse. It turns into an entire and utter whiteout. You can't see who's coming up the trail. You can't see who's going down the trail. Again, on the mountain, the weather changes every 10 minutes. So I'm going to pull over and wait 10 minutes. The wind kicks up to the point where I am literally wondering, the wind can't possibly blow my truck off the top of this mountain peak. I'm at 13,200 feet. I live on the Atlantic Ocean at exactly one foot above sea level. So I'm just going to tough it out. I'm going to sit right here and see what happens. And boy, the amount of hijinks. Three white Land Rovers, white, notice the white out. Three white Land Rovers roll up to the top. Two of them do a three-point turn and back in. You can't see, so why not back in? What could, what could possibly go wrong? And just when I thought that was the worst part, I was completely wrong. So three Range Rovers just came up the pass. You cannot see outside. The vehicles are white. So instead of just driving up like everyone else has ever done, they all pull up and, and back up into zero visibility. That is smart. That is brilliant, man. It takes a certain type of person to drive a Land Rover. Unbelievable. Enjoy social media, fellas. That was the stupidest thing I've ever seen, ever. And I've been, I grew up in Boston. Wow. Zero visibility. Three white Land Rovers head down. But they leave one about a mile behind. Or five, ten minutes behind. And there they are. See them? Neither will the guy coming up. It's beautiful. Look at that. How is that for visibility at 13,000 feet? There's the trail. And there's my descent right there. Yeah, I don't talk to dipshits, dude. Yeah, these guys must work for NASA, man. They must. We just backed into absolute zero visibility. Brilliant. Yeah. Unbelievable. I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen such stupidity in my life. And it's snowing at a good clip right now. Wow. So a Hummer just came up the hill and the kid, the kid gave me these signals. And then this, and then four. So, some poor asshole just didn't ignored me and went straight down. So now there's two coming up and one going down. What could possibly go wrong? I cannot believe the kid in that H1, the monster Hummer, just did this to me. That's what I'm saying. That's why I'm making this video. Because nobody that doesn't know what they're doing should be up here. Because I can't even imagine what's going on down there right now. And I need to go down. The sky just cleared for a minute. You can actually see. What the unreal. So the guy in the green Jeep with the Colorado license plates that's backing up the imaging approach with two Hummers forcing him up, I beeped my horn, told him. He looked right at me. I pointed down the trail, and I gave him two fingers up, which means two vehicles are coming up. He waved and went down anyway. Now, the Hummers were all the way at the bottom and could have sat down there at the turnaround and let this guy come down because he was seven-eighths of the way down. But instead, they forced him up because they're in Hummers and they're from Texas. You know what I'm saying? Unbelievable. So now, let's look at Imogene Pass when the sky is fairly clear. Let's get away from all those bad feelings we just had. 
when you reach the top, the summit, if the weather is clear, this is what you'll be treated to. And this is why we do this. When you're up here, remember, everyone hasn't been up here. Everyone can't take a bus or a plane up here. There's only one way in and one way out. And that's what makes it such a special place. And it's why I go here time and time again. And it's why I've taken such great pains to film this for those of you that can't make it up here. The entire reason I started filming these Overland journals was for the people that can no longer, again, financially, physically, or emotionally find their way up here anymore. So enjoy it. I try. As soon as the fog lifted enough, I headed down. I had to take a shot. Now I've mentioned to you on descents like this, pay attention to who's coming up and who's coming down. You can see, but sadly, people don't do that. So this happens. And once again, one going down, one coming up. Nobody knows what to do. If anybody knew this trail, they would know there's a turnaround down there. So the guy in the white Toyota that's coming up should be able to see the Jeep in front of him, but certainly he can see my green Toyota coming down. But you'd never know that because he acted like this was a two-lane highway and all was well. This is amazing. This Toyota just came up the path even though I was coming down the mountain and you could see me a mile away. And he didn't bother to tell me that there were five vehicles behind him unbelievable this is i've never seen this is like a clinic on how not to drive the mountain unbelievable yeah i've never seen such i've just never seen such a thing in my life it's like these people knew i was making a video on how to drive and how not to drive on a mountain pass and they all signed up and here's the deal. It isn't just people in their own personal vehicles. The tour guides out of Telluride, every single time they drove by, they either kept coming at me even though I was ascending and they didn't make way. That happened twice. But every time they passed me, remember, I was on this trail for three days filming. They never once gave me one finger up, meaning there's one vehicle behind me. Two fingers up, meaning there's two vehicles, three, four, and so on, or a closed fist, like the black power sign, meaning no one's behind me. They all simply waved or just kept coming, and it was unbelievable to me. If you're on the trail and there's a vehicle behind you that you know of, one finger up. If there's two, two fingers up. It isn't rocket science. We're not curing the common cold here. We're driving down a trail. Now, I spoke to several shop owners and this topic came up. This all happened about two years ago where rentals and everyone else just doesn't bother. No one even looks at you unless they have to. When you're out here, you're on your own. It used to be people that did what we're doing were people that could take care of themselves, etc. Well, now with rentals and tour guides, etc., and people driving Jeeps that they don't own the title to, we have melees on the trails. And it can get dangerous, and there's no reason for it. But it appears to be the way society's going. But I will now digress. Back to the trail. Because I've got so much more to show you on the Telluride side, we're going to make this a part two. Because we're already at 40 minutes, I'm in a hotel room in Colorado Springs, and this is in super high definition, so it's, I would doubt it would upload whatsoever at all. So make sure you hit that like, share, and subscribe, and look for about five days from now for part two to be coming up. Leave a comment below, and I'll try to return the favor. I am out.